Hello Internet. Hello YouTube. This is Nate. You can also call me Nathan, but please never call me Nathaniel and welcome to how to get top 10 in the daily challenge. A guide of sorts. Um, yeah, so uh, I do a daily challenge as part of my Monster Train daily show every morning. Um, and I thought, hey, uh, I've been doing this for a long time and not, uh, not everybody is aware of some of the strategies that I use and others use to try to do well in the daily challenge. So I thought I'd put together a little um, series of uh, tips, tricks, um, and just in general, what are the main ways that people achieve uh, really high scores? And of course, you know, we're talking about daily challenge, but in general, a lot of these tips are good for standard runs, for custom challenge runs, for Hell Rush. Uh, but we're going to focus primarily around the daily challenge. To start off, uh, let's uh, give some background. So why why listen to me over anyone else? Um, and and you know, it's a fair fair question. Uh, I have, as I mentioned, pretty religious participation in the daily challenge, so I very, very rarely miss a day. So I would say in terms of just the volume of daily challenges that I've done, um, I've started doing daily challenges back when the game was still in beta. I did daily challenges concurrently when uh, we were in Wild Mutations. I did one in uh, public beta, one in the live system, uh, or live uh, <laughs> version of the game. Uh, and I have had a lot of practice with the mutators on my own doing Monster Train League and all this kind of stuff. So just sheer volume. I've done um, at least several hundred daily challenges since the game got released. Uh, I regularly land in the top 5, 10, or 25 scores. Doesn't mean every time. Sometimes I am in, you know, thousandth place. I just get a really bad run or um, make some really big mistakes. But I would say out of, um, I don't know, a given five runs, probably four out of those five, I'm in the top 25. Maybe one of them, I'm in the top five, and maybe a couple, I'm in the top 10. So I think I'm, I would say, fairly consistent. Not only do I do it a lot, but I feel like I, I do pretty well in my performance. Uh, apart from doing the daily challenges, I have a full logbook. I've completed every expert challenge. I've done all the clan combinations. So I just have, it in, in general, pretty wide knowledge. And uh, I think most important, there, there's a scholar right in the corner of the page, and he doesn't show up unless uh, the guide really is top notch. So the fact that he's here should indicate already that uh, we're talking about some seriously helpful tips coming up. Okay, um, success criteria to evaluate a deck. Uh, so again, if you watched my other guide or if you've seen any of my uh, other content, I talk about this a lot. There are kind of three standard success criteria which I use um, when determining whether a build is uh, Covenant 25 viable. Um, it's very similar to what I consider for a uh, daily challenge viable deck. Um, so we start off, uh, the deck must be able to clear large units. That means units greater than 190 health. Um, that's about the cap that you're ever going to get. The, you can, with certain like incant stuff, get higher than 190 health, but it's very rare. Um, you must have backline access of greater than 10 damage. That either means that you have enough damage to burst through the large unit and have additional units behind, or you have sweep, or you have spells, or you have spikes, or some way of accessing the backline directly. Um, you must be able to survive all boss relentless phases. That's quite important. Um, I would say the, the main ones are the, the flying bosses, um, floor five and floor seven. The other ones are not usually so bad. Um, and then for daily challenge, and this is really important for daily challenge, you must be able to kill flying bosses early. And uh, I'll explain a little bit why this is so critical for daily challenge oriented decks. Um, but let's start with uh, a little bit of math um, and talk about how scoring works in Monster Train. If you're already aware, um, you can feel free to skip this section, go directly into the next section, which is more around the tips and guides. Uh, but I thought for a lot of people, they're not aware of exactly how uh, the scoring method is, is showing up. Um, so I thought I'd go through that in a little bit more detail. So the first thing is each ring has a base score um, and that base score never changes. It's always the same for every ring, no matter which bosses you get or which variations you get. Um, you can see the scores there. I won't go into detail, but you can see, I mean, as you would expect, 
the rings get progressively higher scores as the game gets progressively more difficult. Um, there are early peaks with Daedalus and Fell who have, uh, they double the score of the previous ring and then the next ring kind of backs off a little bit. And that makes sense. The flying bosses are definitely more difficult and are uh, bigger skill checks of your deck. So that's, that's your base scores. On top of your base scores, you have several different modifiers. The first one is that your score gets reduced based on damage taken. And the rate is every, um, every pyre damage you take reduces the score by 2%, and that caps at 25 pyre damage. So if you're going for score, and for example, you've already taken 25 pyre damage, you don't need to worry about taking any more pyre damage because you can't get any less score. Um, so, but like the difference between taking 10 pyre damage and taking 20 pyre damage is a 20% score reduction. Um, and I should also mention that all these different modifiers, they are not mul multiplicative, they are additive. Um, so when we talk about uh, total score, when we get to that at the end, uh, consider that all of these are additive percentages. So this would be minus 50%, and then you could negate that with some other modifiers. Um, the other important thing about pyre damage taken is that it is a net health loss, meaning if you take damage and in that same battle heal back the pyre damage, it will not count as a score loss. So as long as you can heal back to the same level that you were at the start of the battle, you will not have any score loss. Uh, I would say it's not often that you have a lot of opportunities to heal your pyre, but it does become relevant in some specific cases where you can heal your pyre and get back that score that you would have lost by taking damage. On the other hand, you don't get any bonus for net health gain. So if you start off at a lower health total, you've taken some damage maybe in an earlier fight or you took damage due to a concealed cavern event, if you heal during that battle, you don't get any bonus score. So it's only um, that you can uh, mitigate a little bit of the score loss by healing your pyre back up if you take damage in that same battle. Okay, next one is that your score gets increased by taking trials. The modifier is always 50%. So uh, if you consider your damage taken score caps out at negative 50% and your trial caps out at 50%, or is 50%, um, if you take a trial and then you take 25 damage, you have a net zero because they are additive. So you get minus 50%, plus 50%, equalizing at zero. So you just take then your base score um, or the base score of that ring. Um, there are no trial bonuses possible for flying bosses. Your score gets increased based on early boss kills. And this is for every single ring. Uh, you get a plus 10% modifier for every single turn early you kill the boss. And what's important here is that it is turn early, not floor early. So if you have, for example, you're, you're on uh, the very first ring and the boss shows up and you ascend the boss, it's still that same turn, so you still get a full three turn early kill by ascending, descending. So movement does not affect the score multiplier. Just so you're aware, there are cases when you'll want to play a build. For example, let's imagine you're doing a sketches build. Um, your middle floor is gonna be your floor where you're setting up. Uh, and if you want to get the highest score possible with a sketches build, you often want to ascend the bosses as they're showing up into that middle floor to get that first or that uh, three turn early kill. So how does that stack up? Um, for normal bosses, the best uh, score you can get or the best modifier you can get is plus 30%. That's three turns early. That means that you're killing the, the, the normal boss um, the turn that it arrives and starts relentless. And again, you can ascend to try to move the boss into a more favorable floor to get that early three turn kill. For Daedalus, it caps at 80%. That is an eight turn early kill. That's killing Daedalus on the first turn of the battle while he's still um, flying. And with Fel and Seraph, it caps at 100% uh, or 10 turns. So for Fel and Seraph, you actually theoretically can double 
your base score, but it would require you to kill them on the first turn, which is pretty rare. It can happen, and there are ways to do it, uh, both using infinites and using um, other types of builds. Uh, and if you do, you get a full 100% score increase. And as mentioned, that's all. All these score modifiers are additive. Uh, the very last one is there is a single additive score at the end based on your final coin total. And one thing you should note about this is that throughout the run, it will consider your, your coin total in your current score, which is why some cases when you're playing Hell Rush or when you're doing a daily challenge, you might wonder like, why is it 1810? Why does it sometimes switch to um, 1825 or 1805? That's all based on your coin total. So your coin total at that moment is being added on top of your current score. It's not, you won't see it in the full diagram and it doesn't get added for every single ring, but it just takes your current ring base score and then just adds on top of it how many coins you have at the end of the battle um, before you've taken rewards. And that's your current score. So oftentimes if somebody like, for example, skips the, uh, the artifact, they take the coins instead of the artifact, they're gonna have a slightly higher score even if you got the same um, modifiers in terms of your, your score. You took you both took the trial, you both killed the boss on the first floor, you both didn't take pyre damage, but one took the coins, one took an artifact, and that will make a 25 point difference. Okay, um, so the score is one point per coin you have at the end of the game, and that caps at 2,500 points or 2,500 coins. And again, that's not a percentage modifier, that's just a flat uh, one point per coin. Okay, so what does that mean in total? So the entire range, reviewing all rings, um, you see there's quite a big spread. So you can have, uh, for example, on ring one, anywhere from a score of 500 to a score of 1800, depending on the total of the modifiers. And you'll notice that it's much heavier weighted around the flying bosses. So if you look at like rings three, six, and eight, the totals there, add up by themselves to a potential 35,000 points. More than half of the score comes from just flying boss early kill potential. So um, while I say that, it's still important to consider the, getting the maximum score out of all the other rings, but there's definitely a huge bias towards getting early kills on the flying bosses because they have the highest base scores and they have the uh, highest potential score with early kill. Okay, so then let's go into a quick summary here. Um, final score, important points to note. The highest possible score you can get, this means getting perfect on every single floor. You never take damage. You always kill on the first turn possible. That includes Daedalus, Fell, and Seraph. And you have 2,500 coins. All of that will add up to a score of 60,400. Um, this score is not possible without specific mutators and luck. Um, it's extremely unlikely to get this score uh, because really the biggest hurdle is um, getting enough coins. You have to have a modifier that can allow you to get 2,500 coins and that's not gonna show up very often. And then uh, getting early Daedalus kills. Fel and Seraph are a little bit more reasonable because you have a lot of time then to, for example, build up a permanent stacking unit to have a lot of damage or put together your infinite combo. But by the time you reach Daedalus is extremely rare. You still have a lot of train stewards by then. You still have a lot of your starter cards and those are gonna inhibit your ability to kill Daedalus in the first turn. So it is, it's, this is the highest technical possible score, but it's extremely rare. You shouldn't expect to get it. Um, a really high score in general, you can kind of like keep in mind is anything above a 50,000. Uh, and that's also the achievement, right? So the, there's an achievement for getting plus 50,000 on a daily challenge. And what I should note about that is that achievement does not require you to get it on your first attempt. You can replay daily challenges over and over again to try to get that 50K score. Um, and it will still count uh, for the achievement purposes. Uh, but yeah, getting a high score is like getting 50K. Um, a perfect score without any flying kills at all. So flying kills mean uh, you kill the boss while they're still flying, not while they're doing Relentless, is 48,400. Um, so you cannot get a 50,000 point score 
without getting early flying kills. It's not possible. So if you're thinking, ah, okay, I can get a, I can get that 50k just by playing and, and making sure I don't take any damage, taking all the trials, you still can't do it unless you have a 50k score, which is why I mentioned at the very beginning, one of the main points of getting into the top 10 or top 25 of the daily challenge is you have to build a deck that can reliably kill flying bosses during their flying stage before they go relentless. To emphasize that, just think about with Fel and Seraph, every single turn you are losing 600 or 900 points respectively. So every extra turn you're taking to kill them is losing you points. And about the same amount of points as you get from a trial on floors one, two, and four. That's how important getting early kills are um, on the uh, Fel, Seraph, and Daedalus, right? Daedalus less so, but Fel and Seraph especially, getting those early kills have a massive contribution to your overall score. Okay, enough about math. Uh, let's talk about cheating. Uh, there is cheating in the game. Uh, people do cheat. Uh, if you are curious, how do you know whether someone cheated? Here are the main tells that show a top score very likely uh, was using some type of hack on the game. Um, one, they will have a significantly higher number of rel uh, relics relative to the other players. And that relative to the other players is quite important because there are certain modifiers like uh, blessed, which give you a lot of relics. So if you have something like that where it's obvious someone can get a lot of relics, then it's probably not that they're cheating. But if you see like most players have somewhere between six to eight relics, and then you see a guy with 20 relics, he was hacking. There's no way he could have gotten that uh, relative to the other players. Uh, same with number of coins. Uh, there's some very obvious ones. You'll see people with like 11,000 coins. Okay, yeah, they were hacking. You can't get that even with all modifiers unless you have some insane infinite combo, and then you would likely see it in other players as well. Uh, but even things like if you see most of the top players um, have coin totals between like um, 800 and 1,000, and then you see a player with 2,500 without any coin generation in their uh, either a coin relic or coin units or coin spells, uh, very likely they were hacking as well. It's very difficult, honestly, it's very difficult to get 2,500 without a modifier, a relic, or uh, some type of infinite combo. And I would say most of the time you're not infiniting, infiniting, most of the time you're not doing an infinite combo to get massive amounts of coins. But sometimes it's a side effect and you will see this occasionally. Um, early boss kills relative to the other. So again, you look at like the top 10 scores and you see most of them are getting uh, Seraph kills like four turn, five turn, and then you see a 10 turn. And especially if you see that they have a really low card count, like they might have one draft unit, a couple of train stewards, a spell, and then their champion, and they have a floor 10 kill. Even if everything else looks fine, it's not fine. They obviously did something to cheat because you can't get that much damage on your first turn killing Seraph with such low cards. And uh, and then the last one is like fast clear times. If you see like a 12 minute run or even a 20 minute run with a significantly higher uh, score and with much earlier boss kills, pretty sure they were hacking. So what do you do? If you see that people are cheating, uh, if you see it in game, press F8. F8 will bring up the feedback dialogue to the developers. Just type in the name of the uh, suspected cheater, the day of the daily challenge, and a little explanation why you think that they were cheating. Uh, the developers are checking that very regularly, and then they can immediately go in and remove them from the scoreboard. Typically, it also results in a ban. So uh, you're helping out to not only um, get you know the score out of there to make sure that the score is the scores that are in there are more um, representative of the daily challenge, but you're also helping to get people that are cheating uh, punished pro appropriately, which is appropriate, right? Like, yeah, you might say it's oh it's a daily challenge, who cares? But uh, I think it is important that we try to keep some integrity in multiplayer games like this. So that's the first way. Second way is you can go into the Monster Train Discord. Um, the Discord link is in the video description, and you can post a message in the specific daily challenge channel. And uh, you can either directly message one of the developers, you'll see on the right side up at the top, right side, right side up at the top, you'll see the list of uh, um, shiny shoe developers. Just ping one of them and say, hey, I think there's a cheater. 
this is the name, please check it out. Um, or you can just type a message in there, I think this guy was cheating and they're regularly checking and, and addressing it. What about other things? What about scouting? Um, there are players that scout. So scouting ahead means that you are uh, either using a different account or you are looking at like a streamer or a YouTube video to try to get an idea about how the, um, what cards are gonna be drafted, what events there are in Concealed Caverns, what upgrade paths there are. Um, for sure, some of the top scores are scouting. Uh, you will occasionally see scores where the entire deck is built around a Concealed Cavern rare card draft, right? Like you could tell from the beginning they were building towards getting that one card. There's no way you're doing that unless you're scouting. Does happen. Uh, what about restarting? Uh, a lot of players restart. Sometimes I restart. Um, what's my opinion? And again, this is just my opinion. Um, you have to decide for yourself what, what you're going to use, right? Apart from just actually hacking the game, which I think is objectively um, dishonest, these ones are a little bit more gray area. Um, if you're watching a streamer and then you later go to the daily challenge, does that mean you got an advantage? Of course. Is there any way to prevent that? Absolutely not. Uh, for me, I don't feel comfortable scouting. And, and part of the reason I do the daily challenge is to challenge myself, right? Like I, I do like when I get high scores, but I also accept when I don't get high scores. Um, and would, and I, for me, what I enjoy is jumping into a challenge I've never seen before trying to put together a deck and seeing how far I can take it and how well I can perform. And scouting for me removes that challenge. For other people, if their goal is to just um, theory craft with all the knowledge that they have ahead of time, you know, I, I want to get an, I want to get the highest score, I want to show that I can infinite. Um, yeah, I mean, people do that. It's not for me, but I'm not going to say that what they're doing is wrong. Um, it's just a different way of uh, approaching the game and I would say test a different set of skills. And uh, for me, it's not particularly enjoyable. Restarting, uh, restarting is, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with, with restarting battles. Um, starting all the way back with uh, Slay the Spire. Um, and I would say Slay the Spire has even less variability on restarting. Of course, you can restart Slay the Spire and you can modify card draw and stuff like that. But with Monster Train, the tactical combat has such depth to it that absolutely where you play units has a huge impact on whether you finish a battle well or poorly. Much more so than any other deck builder type game that I've played before. So uh, there's definitely an advantage if you decide I'm going to restart and perfect every battle. Um, yeah, you're going to perform better. That's just a given. One, because you're going to have way more information. You have all of the card draw RNG. You have the enemy RNG. You have boss pattern RNG. All of that sorted out. And then you can play completely around it. Um, for me, typically my restarts fall under one of two categories, one of which I'm trying to eliminate. So one is... There was a very obvious mistake. I recognized it the moment I played it, and there is no undo, right? There's no, there's no undo my action. And so for me, I'm comfortable with the idea that, okay, I played a unit in the wrong position, and the moment I did it, it was an accident, it was a misclick, or I just didn't take enough time to think it through, and it's very obvious, then I will restart, I will play up to that point exactly the same, and then I will do the correct play in that moment. So uh, the idea is in that case, I'm not trying to take advantage of the knowledge which I have, and I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm trying to like, really just go and fix a mistake that I clearly made, and I knew it the moment I made it. The second type of restarting is the solving the puzzle restart. Typically, I and, and I said, this is one where I'm trying to get less and less because I find the more that I do it, the less fun it is. But this is where like you have an incredibly complex tactical combat and there is a possible series 
to try to basically survive. Like it's not even at this point about trying to get a high score. It's like, how, can I survive? Can I survive this Sarah fight? Can I survive this fell fight? And historically, I've done a lot of restarts in these specific cases where I'm like, I feel like there's a way to survive. I want to retry until I can do it. Um, I can with confidence because I went back and looked at all of my, um, at least all of my top scores that I've done in the past in daily challenges. I can with confidence say that none of these contributed to a top 25 finish. Every time I had to do this, I was easily in like, somewhere between 50 and 100 or even further down. So this was for me not a trying to get a top score, it was a trying to not die. Um, but even there, I've, as I said, I found that it's become less and less enjoyable and I'm trying to trim out the number of cases where I do this kind of restart puzzle solving style battle, at least on the daily challenges. Sometimes I still do it with um, regular Covenant 25 play, but. Um, but yeah, I think, sorry, long explanation, but I think every person has to decide again, what do what are they comfortable with? Um, the developers have been very clear. They're not going to put in any measures to mitigate these um, because there are too many cases which would be unfairly punished. Um, when you talk about restarting, you say, okay, well, why not just have a block on restarting? Well, what happens if the game crashes? Do you just punish somebody because their game crashed? I don't think it's fair. And I think um, given that, the rewards for finishing the daily challenge as well are very minimal. It's just like karma or you know, like bragging rights. I feel like it's it's okay to allow these tools, even if it means that some players will use it to take an advantage and then get better scores as a result. That's my thoughts on cheating. Um, if you have a difference of opinion, please put it in the comments. Uh, send me an angry letter. But, uh, but this is how I feel about the topic. Okay, so enough background. You didn't come here for background. You didn't come here for monologues. You came here for uh, tips, tricks, and uh, easy ways to succeed. So let's get into that. General tips. First general tip is get a feel for how to look at the current top scores and get an impression. What does that mean in terms of how the run is going to perform? So what can you look for? Uh, you can look for uh, both the score and the amount of time spent. So if you're seeing quite a few scores that are 50K, but the time that they played was with greater than an hour, it's very likely that these are uh, high scores due to an infinite combo. Because these infinite combos, they don't scale very fast. They do scale infinitely, but they scale slowly. So you're playing the same card combination, you know, 100 times, 200 times. Um, which takes a lot of time sometimes, depending on the animations of the cards. But then you're able to kill Seraph and Fell first turn, second turn, and that's how they're getting these high scores. If you see scores 50k less than an hour, that means there is a non-infinite or a incredibly fast scaling infinite early flying kill build possible. When it comes to like how reliable is it to get this build or how easy, then you just look at how many players have it. If you see something like the top 50 players are all 50k. Uh, very likely, it's you. You can't miss this build, right? Like if that many players have been able to achieve it, it's it's uh, got to be pretty obvious. It's like a card draft that you're getting from a trial. It's a card draft that you're gonna likely take no matter what, um, and that's what's setting up your early flying kill. If you just see like a couple of them, and then a whole bunch of people in like the high to mid 40 thousands. It means that there is an early flying kill possible, but it might be incredibly difficult or complex to set up. If you're seeing all the top scores in the mid to high 40K, that typically means that a flying kill is difficult, um, especially beyond like a four turn flying kill. Um, so then you kind of kind of expect, and it's probably a very straightforward run, but not a run that's gonna get you early boss kills. Uh, and then finally, if you see things in the low 40Ks, that is a sign, buckle up, you're in for a really difficult run. This either means that people were not taking trials because they were scared, they were taking damage throughout the run to lower their overall score totals, or uh, a lot of people just didn't ever finish. So uh, yeah, if you ever see anything low, low 4K, and you might think, wow, well 40K is still a pretty good score. Yeah, but if you're seeing the top players are getting low 40K, yeah, that's a, that's a really, really tough daily challenge. So get prepared, 
you're probably in for a rough ride. Second, take every trial. Don't be a wuss. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I, I say that, but like really, you just can't miss trials. There's so many points on the line. 6,250 points are on the line if you choose to skip any trial. And no matter how difficult the trial is, as long as you live, you were not worse off. You can't lose more points than you gain from the trial because the most points you can lose, 25 points, is a minus 50%. You get 50% from the trial, you're net even. So uh, you just you take every trial. Um, and the other thing too is it's good practice for you. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know, trial might be really difficult. I don't wanna have to play around it. That's kind of what the daily challenge is pushing you to do. Really um, stretch yourself and, and really try to perform uh, at a higher level than you have in, in you know your standard runs. Even if you don't think you're gonna survive, really just take the trial and go for it. Um, if you lose, you lose, but you learn something hopefully. And this is the this is again part of the goal is how do I um, how do I know my limits if I don't uh, stretch myself? And then finally, like the rewards themselves can be really, really important to your run. The coins matter when you're talking about upgrading spells, upgrading item, or upgrading spells, upgrading units, removing units, um, getting artifacts, getting unit drafts. I mean, you might say, oh, this trial is really difficult for this unit draft, and then that unit draft might be exactly the unit draft that everyone took that got them their early flying kills. So you don't want to also miss out on any of the rewards because you're not certain going into it what was that, that thing that put the run together so that these people could get such high scores. And oftentimes those are rewards coming from the trials. So yeah, just do it. Just, just, just have the habit that you don't miss any trials during the daily challenge. And eventually you'll start to improve and be more consistent. Build your deck around flying kills. I've mentioned this over and over, but it's, it's, it's the differentiator between a standard run and a daily challenge run, and even to an extension, hell rush runs, is the winners, they, they have decks that can kill Seraph and Fell early. It's such a huge point advantage. Again, you kill you kill Seraph three turns earlier than somebody else. That is a full ring, uh, a full ring three, Daedalus kill in points. It's it's such a huge advantage. Um, you really need to be considering that, and that means by extension, when you're drafting cards, you should ask yourself: Does this card contribute to a flying kill and if it doesn't it doesn't mean you can't take the card if you need it to survive until Seraph of course you take cards that help you to survive but you should be a lot more cautious if it's not gonna fit into one of these major archetypes that will help me get a flying kill I really need to hesitate or consider whether it's worth taking that draft card that, that goes for units and for spells uh, I think this is pretty obvious but uh, and I'll go into mutators later on in the guide, but you really should consider um, what does this mutator do to my run? And you should look at it not just from a general perspective. Oh, okay, I have a uh, uh, broken valve. I'm going to start uh, with randomized card costs, but then think about what does that mean? What does that mean for these clans which I've picked? Um, having Brawler, in Hellhorned is significantly different than having Brawler in Stygian Guard in terms of what is the impact of that mutator. So look at not just, okay, the mutators as standalone, but consider how do they affect the clans which I have to play with during this daily challenge. And what I would recommend, especially the first times that you are um, going into the daily challenges and you're trying to be more serious about the daily challenge, go through your logbook. Check out what cards are gonna come through my clan, what draft units can I get, and what does that mutator do for those draft units? That way you're already thinking ahead, what kind of deck can I put together with these mutators that will help me get those flying kills and help me get through all of the bosses. And that also includes looking at potential synergies. If you have something like um, two times unit placement, you might want to consider, okay, uh, maybe I need to pick a really, really good champion that I can play out, duplicate, rather than uh, you know the champion that I might normally play with. So if I'm playing a Stygian Guard and I'm very used to playing Conduit, 
Well, double conduit doesn't really do a whole lot. You don't need minus six cost on spells. So I might end up going with um, Chillwind instead because the Chillwind might have a better impact. Or if I'm doing Penumbra, I might consider, you know what, does, does Double Gorge Penumbra really do a lot for me? Not really. Um, probably better would be to get Monstrous or Architect where having their effect doubled is a lot stronger. So again, looking at what are the synergies um, with my deck that can combo with those mutators and thinking about that very early on because that's when those choices become most important. The first, I would say, four rings dictate 90% of what you're going to do the rest of the game. There's, there are, for certain, you can pivot later on, but it's much more difficult. That's when you get all your unit drafts. That's when you get your first rare card. That's when you get your first major upgrades on your cards. So the earlier you can identify those benefits, those combos, or on the alternative, um, cards that will struggle due to the mutators, the better. Okay. And uh, last, check the flying boss symbols. Um, they're there from the very beginning of the run. Uh, Friends and foes is really nice because they added a UI which tells you what they all are. But uh, until then, or even after then, if you forget, get a feel for which symbol on the map. When I say symbol, I mean the uh, the battle token symbol when you click on their battle token to start their battle will indicate which version of the flying bosses that they are um, and consider that like if you have if you have um, the fell that puts uh, extra blights in your deck well you might need to prepare for that and think yeah you know what i can't take so many high ember cost cards because i know i'm gonna have to face this fell and i don't have a way to deal with that fell um, if I am burning all my ember every turn or um, you know if you have the uh, Daedalus with the extinguish triggers you might think oh you know what playing my monstrous penumbra on that bottom floor is gonna kill him because all those extinguish triggers from his trampler are just gonna just gonna take out all of his health so think about ahead of time how do I need to prepare for these uh, these specific flying boss setups um, there's a link in the description. It's also kind of at the bottom, but I think I'm half covering it up. But there's a Reddit post uh, that somebody made uh, that shows you every single symbol and what they represent in case you forget. So having that handy can also help in case you don't yet have, um, you know, memorized the different symbols and, and what they mean. Okay, let's get into some common builds that you're going to see that help you to get early flying kills on the major bosses. First one, simple plan. Uh, this is probably the most common one. If you're gonna see, if you're gonna see scores where like the top 250 all have 50k scores, this is how they did it. It's sketches plus shadow siege or plus consumer of crowns. It's a very straightforward build. Uh, it's the it's the build for the world record speed run uh, for a reason. Turns out that it's also the best build for getting high scores. Um, nothing really beats being able to kill Seraph on the first turn without having to play a single card. Um, so if you if you see a lot of high scores and there is a sketches of salvation early, guaranteed one of these two is going to show up and they are going to stomp Fel and Seraph to great success. Not much more to say about this. Permanent scaling death ball builds. Uh, there are coming, I would say, two primary flavors. One is the overgorge flavor. And uh, here then you get an early overgorger. You start stacking it with tons of morsels. Ideally you get uh, the artifact, which is doubling gorge triggers. And yeah, you scale them up to insane levels. You give him multi-strike, you give him quick. Maybe you give him two multi-strikes. And then at the end, you duplicate him maybe once, maybe twice, and you just blow out Seraph with uh, two overgorgers or three overgorgers on the floor. Very straightforward. Similarly, the Bounty Stalker build. So you get Bounty Stalker uh, very early. Likely you get it during the Daedalus um, Rare Relic draft. You start scaling him throughout the whole rest of the run. And by the end, he's doing 200 to 300 damage. Multi-strike, quick. Maybe you put Burnout on him to guarantee he's going to die. Maybe you put Endless on him, however you end up doing it. Um, even better if you can get uh, double extinguish triggers. Uh, other things to look out for is Intent on Death, 
or um, subsuming blade to be able to kill him consistently. But basically, yeah, both of these operate the same way. You have permanent scaling. You permanently scale them to insanely high damage numbers, and then you use them to kill Seraph and Fell very, very early. The big spiky burst build. So this is a uh, an Awoken specific build. You take the Sentient, um, you take uh, Bristling as your upgrade path, and you get Bramble Ash. Either you get Bramble Ash as your, one of your starting cards, or you get it very early, and then you dupe it, and you dupe it, and you dupe it. And uh, it turns out that being able to do 400 damage per Bramble Lash does a lot of damage to Seraph and to Fell. Um, even better if you can get it with a Stygian Guard and get um, Energy Siphons or uh, Urchin Spines and get Spell Weakness. That's the word I was looking for, Spell Weakness. Then you're talking about doing anywhere from eight to two, 800 to 2,000 damage per Bramble Lash. So... Um, yeah, what this often means is you want to play your Sentient in the middle or top floor, and you need to have a way to clear units on the bottom floor so that you have a free open lane to just blast Seraph. Um, ideally, you also want uh, minus one cost and hold over on the Bramble Lashes so you can play them every turn. The Angriest Prince, um, you've seen this build before if you watched my other video, but it's also a really great way to get flying kills. Uh, typically, you're going to pair this with um, Ritual of Battle, Last Stand, that's your scaling. Um, you want Brawler. You can, you don't necessarily with this one have to go um, with the Wrathful Hornbreaker Prince. In fact, oftentimes you don't want to play Wrathful, you want to go full Brawler. You go uh, full Brawler, so you have as a starting uh, five hits, you get times four multi strike. You have then Rage stacking, and then even better is if you can get a One Horns Tome or a Furnace Tap on top. Even the full Ember Drain build, the full Ember Drain build gives you a lot of Rage, and you just dump it all onto your Hornbreaker Prince and put Hornbreaker Prince on the middle or top floor, put something else that can clear the bottom floor, and you just hit Seraph in the face, hit Fell in the face with lots of Rage and lots of Multi-Strike. The Angriest Prince, but also Battering Ram. So this one you do need to go Wrathful, you take the Hornbreaker Prince, you get at least one Spike Applicator, typically that's a Sharpen, and then uh, you do re you have a Reinforce, so you put him on the bottom floor, and you have all the units running into him dying, and then on top of that you get Battering Ram, and you dupe it and you dupe it, and very similar to the Bramble Lash build, you burst out Seraph with a massive Battering Ram. Um, if you can't get Sharpen, then uh, any type of uh, armor application will be helpful. Best would be, in that case, like an imp. You get, uh, you get the armor imp, you have transcend imp, and you get the relic which doubles your summoning effects. So then you play down your armor imp, you get 40 armor, you play down transcend imp, you get another 80 armor, and that's enough to do 320 damage with the battering ram. So. Uh, and actually even more than that, that would be 480 damage with the Battering Ram. And then you just need a way to kill the bottom floor. But I would say that the Sharpen plus Reinforce is also very consistent. You can get huge, huge, huge volumes of armor, and then you Battering Ram to kill Seraph very quickly. Ultimate Incant Floor. So here you want um, Tethys, preferably Conduit Tethys, so that you're reducing the cost of your damage spells. You get a Nameless Siren. Uh, Nameless Siren scales much faster than Siren of the Sea, although you can use Siren of the Sea if you need it. And then uh, you get Offering Monuments and you get a whole bunch of spells. So um, with Tethys reducing the cost of all the damage spells and with Offering Monument drawing your cards every time, you can just get insane scaling. There are even some infinite combos with, uh, with Offering Monument that make this much easier. But even without uh, infinites, you still get a massive amount of spells out um, ideally, Nameless Siren has times two multi strike, or even three multi strike, or sorry, either one or two multi strike added on top. Um, and again, then you just burst out Seraph on a middle or top floor with all the rage that you're getting on the Nameless Siren. Specific mutators, starting with duality. Um, so, duality allows for a lot of scaling to happen much faster. Um, so, what, what are considered status effects? That is multi-strike, quick, sweep, rage, um, frostbite, 
uh, Ember Drain, Spell Weakness, and Spikes. There are some others as well. I'm trying to think what else is on top of that. Fragile, Regen. But all these status effects, all these status effects, you double their effect. So if you have, for example, um, one multi strike, it actually counts as two multi strike. If you have uh, two rage, it actually counts as four rage. So uh, yeah, being able to scale much faster with builds like the Angriest Prince, the Ultimate Incant build, um, or even the Spike builds. Yeah, I mean the Spike again with spikes, right? Double stacks. That means you have a, a sentient that starts with 80 stacks. So uh, it becomes much easier to burst down Seraph with those uh, with that much spikes at the beginning. Broken Valve. Uh, Broken Valve allows for um, getting units that typically you can't get. It's you can use it for spells, but I would say it's really the the ideal setup is you get Broken Valve with Shadow Siege or with Consumer of Crowns. You lower their cost down to a maximum of three. They're much easier to play, and those two units in particular are very easy to use to get early flying kills. Again, there are some spell-oriented ones you can do with Broken Valve, but as I said, I think the the ideal way to play Broken Valve is with really expensive units that are really, really strong. Cheap Trick. So Cheap Trick helps with your incant builds. It also helps to get uh, Ember Drain operating much better. One of the big problems with Ember Drain is then all your spells you can't play out. Uh, but when you have Cheap Trick, getting the Ember Drain package, scaling units really hard, um, incanting becomes much much easier. Hive mind, uh, hive mind is another really great way to get 50k scores. You'll often see uh, when there is hive mind that there are 50k scores. Uh, the main way that people are doing this is with Umbra and with um, mitosis. So you use uh, the way that mitosis works is that it uh, duplicates a morsel three times. With Hive Mind, every unit is considered as a morsel. So when you play it, and then you play Mitosis, you get three more of that unit. So that's uh, the main ones you're going to target with that are uh, Penumbra. You get Monstrous Penumbra. You play Hive Mind, or you play Mitosis on it. Now you have four Penumbras. Um, Overgorger. You stack your Overgorger to insane levels. Then when you get into the Fel and Seraph fight, you use Hive Mind on it. Uh, Bounty Stalker, uh, Rector Flicker. Any of these where um, they have extremely high base stats, even Shadow Sieges or Consumer of Crowns will also work. But that's the whole idea. The whole build is centered around Mitosis. There are other, other, other ways to do it as well. Um, you can get Consumer of Crowns out much easier with Hive Mind because all units are then considered as imps. So any unit you play will reduce the cost of your um, Consumer of Crowns. And then there are some like, I don't know. There's some like uh, out there things like everything's considered to be a tomb unit, so you can get plus 30 health and burnout on them. I don't know. But, there's, but I would say the primary ones are the ones that I described: mitosis, imps, and and so forth. Front loaded. So with front loaded, um, you have again opportunity to play really expensive units that you normally can't play early on. Uh, one thing to consider with front loaded that's very important is making sure you can play blights. It's one of the biggest issues with Front Loaded is if you end up with Seraph the Diligent or with a Fell or a standard boss that's putting Blights in your deck, you're going to struggle unless you have a way to generate Ember. Front Loaded is also one of the main ways to get infinite combos because you have such high starting Ember. You then have a lot of opportunities to use things like uh, Awoken Rail Spike and then get a whole bunch of cards to be free, which then enables a lot of really strong infinite combos. Um, but yeah, with, with Front Loaded, the, the big takeaway here is you need to find a way to deal with Blights if there are going to be Blights. I mean, you can see from the beginning, if you see it's Seraph the Diligent, if you see that the Fell is the Blight Fell, then you need to plan around that and you need to find a way to generate Ember. Now, the way that the minus three Ember per turn works is you can generate Ember by taking an Ember Relic. So if you take uh, one at Daedalus or one at Fell, you will gain one Ember per turn. Um, Oftentimes it's unnecessary and is often better to just get extra draw or extra capacity and then find a card that generates Ember, whether that's, uh, yeah, you could get Perils of Production, you can get Mind Collapse, although you need to be very careful about Mind Collapse because it's an X cost card. 
um, or the uh, excavated eruptions. Excavated eruption. Yeah, that's one that can generate ember. What I'm thinking of is the uh, excavated embers. Excavated embers can do it, but find some way to generate ember, and then you're fine for the rest of the run. And uh, focus on really, really, really expensive units or uh, really expensive spells that you can take advantage of early. Highly reactive. This works on all triggered abilities. Incants, Revenge, Rejuvenate, Slay, uh, Resolve. All of those will be doubled. Again, scaling up your, uh, your Hornbreaker Prince, Wrathful Hornbreaker Prince, scaling up your... Um, sentient rejuvenation triggers, scaling up your uh, incant builds, all of that get uh, improved with highly reactive. It's also a, almost, I would say it's like 99% of highly reactive runs include some form of infinite. It's one of the things that you need to get infinite combos is often being able to double the incant or double the um, extinguish triggers. When you have highly reactive, they're all doubled. So um, it, it almost guarantees, I wouldn't say it's, it's not every single time, but it's most times you have highly reactive as a modifier, there's probably an infinite available uh, if you look for it. A simple plan, we talked about it, don't wanna go any, any further, but this is basically the simple plan build, but you get it from the beginning. And seeing double, very similar to hive mind, uh, get your biggest unit, double, duplicate it. And then uh, it makes it much easier to get early flying kills as long as you have a unit that's doing anywhere from 150 to you know 500 damage. Then doubling that unit is going to make it pretty easy to kill Seraph and Fell early. So those are the ones that I would say you can actually build around to get early flying kills. Um, when it comes to like ones to be careful about and to be cautious around, Brawl is one. Uh, one of the big mistakes you can have with Brawl is forgetting that units don't have one health anymore. Um, so things like those rage minions or rage units that normally have one health, well now they have 11 health. And your torches don't do very good, your, um, your AoE, your, your uh, glimmers, your, why well, can't I think of what it's called right now? Um, the, AoE, the AoE Hornbreaker uh, or um, Hellhorned spell. Yeah, okay, anyway. But yeah, your AoE spells typically aren't gonna do as much damage. For Stygian Guard, it's not as bad because your spells already start with a pretty high damage. So like your Ice Tornado is still pretty good. Your Titan's Tooth is still pretty good. But just be really careful around uh, playing like with Trials, especially become more problematic in some cases. And then just remembering that you're not gonna be able to kill things as easily. I, the other one would be um, the Sentient Bristling. The 10, normally 10 spikes is enough to kill almost everything early game, but now they all have extra 10 health, you need to find a way to do at least one damage to all those units that would normally have one health. So this is one that I think can really throw people if they're not planning around it. Uh, hollow, um, yeah, so hollow affects more than just regen and restore. It also affects lifesteal, which is one of the ones that a lot of people forget about. You get your, uh, you get your, your, uh, Crucible Collector, and he's dying every turn, and you're wondering why, and it's because his lifesteal isn't healing him. So uh, very important, if you have Hollow, don't take lifesteal-oriented stuff, because it doesn't work. Magic Hand, uh, big faults here are forgetting about Blights. Uh, if you don't play your Blight, it stays in your hand and keeps Blighting you. Um, similarly, if you have uh, really high-cost cards, and you don't have the Ember to play them, they will start clogging up your deck. And it's very easy to get in a situation where you're not able to draw any new cards because all of your cards cost a lot. Uh, if you have Magic Hand, be very, very careful about uh, taking the... Uh, it's not called the Broken Valve, it's called the Volatile Gauge. Don't take Volatile Gauge in Magic Hand. Okay, I, not blanket statement. You can take Volatile Gauge with Magic Hand. Be absolutely sure you can play the cards you're drawing if you take Volatile Gauge with Magic Hand. Uh, because it's very, again, it's very easy to all of a sudden have a hand full of three cost cards you can't play. Moth Magic, uh, another one where if you're not thinking about it, all of a sudden you are uh, mindlessly 
torching the final boss because you have a torch in your hand or you're, you're torching the boss, all of a sudden your floor is gone because you tossed the boss up and he killed all your units. So uh, be very careful with uh, moth magic that you don't accidentally ascend when you don't want to. There's a lot of positives here. It means you also can ascend, especially flying bosses, to try to uh, get early kills. You can also um, you know, ascend things like armor units, right? So these heavy armor units that don't do any damage, you can ascend them right to the pyre and then kill the backliners. But I would say the biggest, the biggest concern is don't accidentally uh, damage a unit, putting it at your pyre or uh, killing off your floor if it's a boss. Um, so just be very conscious about when you're playing damage spells when there's moth magic at play. Musical chairs. Uh, musical chairs is one that also throws people a lot. Um, with musical chairs in play, some of the most important things are uh, when you're doing gorge builds, you need to keep your gorge floor free. Uh, if you put, for example, a morsel maker on the same floor as a crucible warden or as your penumbra, about half the time, the uh, morsel maker will buff himself because of them switching positions all the time. So be very cautious about uh, especially gorge builds. Uh, Tethys. Tethys is one that will die very easily if you're not very careful about musical chairs. Um, timing when Tethys is going to go forward and backward. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the where things go is not very transparent. So it's kind of difficult to play around. It's easier when you have two units because then they're just swapping back and forth. But when you start getting three, four, five plus units in a floor, it gets a little bit uh, tricky uh, trying to get the right units up front. There are ways to play around musical chairs. Um, there's the uh, there's the armor. I, man, my cards are escaping me right now. There's the Hellhorn card. Whoops. There's the Hellhorn card, which uh, moves units to the front. That's one way to play around it. You can hold over on that card. You can guarantee that a specific unit is in front all the time. There's also the same with the Awoken card, the uh, zero cost, three damage. Again, I can't think of what it's called right now, uh, but it will also pull a unit, including your own units to the front. So it's a very good way. Um, you might think, why would you damage your own unit? But if you want to have a, um, a specific unit in front, it might be worth um, using it to bring them to the front. Uh, otherwise, just be very careful. Make sure that you're uh, entire floor is tanky enough um, or that uh, you're okay losing some units. Permadeath. Uh, permadeath is one of those where again you might accidentally lose units that you don't intend to lose. Um, there are a couple of ways around permadeath. One is your champion is not affected by permadeath. So it's often better to tank damage with your champion even if you would you know normally not want to tank damage with your champion. You might want to in these cases to keep your other units alive. The other big way around permadeath is endless. So endless units are not affected by permadeath, even if they die. So get endless on your tank, get endless on your whoever, <laughs> get endless on any unit you can, and permadeath becomes much more trivial, at least uh, for most of your units. Uh, this also makes uh, the vote of key one of the best relics to get during permadeath. Um, daily challenges because then uh, you, the first unit you play every turn isn't going to die. One thing to note with Votive Key, however, is that the Votive Key uh, Endless is temporary. So if your unit dies, it will come back, but it loses Endless. Compared with Remnant Pack, a Remnant Pact, which is permanent for the battle, and the Endless Stone, which is permanent for the run. So uh, just make sure when you're playing your units, you're aware what type of endless they have so that you don't accidentally have them get killed. But yeah, permadeath is very tricky. On the other hand, it's a great way to get rid of train stewards. So um, it's a way to clean out decks without having to uh, spend money or use uh, purge charges. Volatile spells. Uh, volatile spells, um, there are a couple of targeted spells which are not affected. Uh, one is the Shroud Spike. Shroud Spike is not affected because it can only target morsels, so it, you are allowed to target with it. Um, there are some spells which cannot target enemy minions. There are any that have friendly in the name, so uh, Restoration Detonation cannot target enemy units. Um, I'm trying to think what other ones. I don't think you can target Fragile with enemy units, so your 
uh, your Hellhorned multi-strike applicator. There's a whole bunch of them that you can't target enemy units. So it's still volatile. You still don't get a pick, but you can guarantee it won't hit enemy units. Uh, a lot of the stuff can target enemy units. So be very careful. Uh, any targeted spells uh, are a risk. So consider really well <laughs> which uh, targeted spells you're going to be using. Um, if you can get ones that only target your side or only target enemies, it's better. Uh, when it comes to front enemy unit spells, so things like Frozen Lance or Helical Crystallis or um, yeah, any of these ones that target the front enemy unit, they are randomized, but they're always enemy units. So if you play Helical Crystallis, you're going to get two random hits on two random targets, um, which is I mean better than, uh, than hitting your own units, but just be aware it also is randomized. On the positive note, that, mean your sting that means your Stings and your Frozen Lances can hit the back line. Uh, which normally they're not able to do. So there's some positives there, but I would say mostly it's quite scary with volatile spells. Uh, just be very careful, careful with them. And Acid Rain. Um, yeah, Acid Rain, one positive to Acid Rain is it makes any of the start your game with, or start your run or battle with units on every floor, that is basically not a factor anymore because they all die before they reach the pyre. Uh, on the other hand, Consider that your backliners like Tethys and Animus of Will are going to take two damage per turn and they can die very, very easily. Um, even if you have full restore oriented decks, you are going to have to likely spread your restores around to make sure that your units aren't dying to the Acid Rain. Uh, also, Fragile kills them. If you happen to get Fragile on a unit by playing the multi strike card from the Hellhorn, it will die to Acid Rain. Um, yeah. Other thing to, to consider with Acid Rain is it happens at the end of the turn, which means that your Harvest triggers, if you, for, so for example, if you have Harvest Rector Flicker and Big Sludge on the bottom floor, and the backliner is going to die to Acid Rain, he's going to die when he gets to the next floor. So you want to make sure that uh, you're thinking about if you can't kill backliners, you might want to position a floor above so that you take advantage of all the Harvest triggers of the Acid Rain when they go to the next floor. It's the same with uh, Jack Strips. Okay, finally googly eyes. Uh, very important to have as much fun as possible when there's googly eyes in play. Uh, if you're not having as much fun as possible when googly eyes are in play, uh, uninstall the game because uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. You have no feelings. One note about infinite combos. They exist. I've mentioned this a couple of times. They do exist. And oftentimes, the very, very top scores uh, are going to be based on infinite combos. Uh, for me, I don't typically go for infinite combos. And the main reason why is that I stream my daily challenge runs. It's part of my Monster Train Daily Show. Um, and I don't like to do infinite combos for 60 minutes. I don't find that very uh, engaging content. I have done it a few times, and it's been a not-so-positive experience for me. So if you don't love doing the same action over and over again to try to get a high score, skip out on the infinite combos. If you want to try them, they can be kind of interesting for the first few times you do it. Uh, but just, just so you're aware, uh, for me personally, I don't love it because I don't love... Uh, the infinite combos typically don't scale very fast. They're very slow scaling. I think one of the, one of the most uh, offending infinite combos is the Votaveri... Uh, the Votaveri, what is it called? The Scaling Melting Remnant card. You get two Votaveris, you get um, double Extinguish Triggers, and you kill the Votaveri, which then draws two cards, which then draws you the card you can scale with, and you can just keep killing your Votaveris over and over again, and you're scaling at a rate of five damage per play. You have to get up to like 2,000 damage to kill Seraph, so you're playing that card what 400 times not very engaging for me so uh, i typically avoid uh endless or uh, infinite combos for that reason but they do exist and uh if you are interested there are some good videos on youtube for how to do infinite combos okay so that is it with the um written portion of the guide uh, i thought it'd be fun now to finish off with one daily challenge run where I try to apply the tips which I've just mentioned 
and kind of demonstrate how they work in real time. So I'm gonna switch over now into Monster Train and demonstrate a standard daily challenge run. All right, we are in the daily challenge for August 30th. Uh, only two hours left, so we have to do this pretty quick. And we'll start by looking at the scores. What we see is a lot of mid 40,000s. Um, let's see how many people have actually finished it. We have to get pretty far down. I like to see how far we have to go down to find where people are not actually finishing the run. It's pretty far down, so it looks like it's a run that most people have been able to finish pretty well. Uh, but it is a run that uh, people are not getting early flying kills. So very likely, uh, apart from this one three hour, they're all very short times too. So we're looking at no real infinites, which makes sense. Volatile spells really affects how likely you can do infinites. We have Stygian Guard and Hellhorned. Um, with Stygian Guard and Hellhorned, they do have some AoE type spells, which could be really good. One Track Mind also makes it a little bit more difficult because you can't pick which way you're going to go. And Mansion uh, gives us more space to work with. So uh, torches are going to be really bad. We want to get rid of the torches as early as possible because of the volatile spells, uh, which might be difficult because we have one track mines, so we can't guarantee that we get um, the vortexes to remove them. We might have to use coins to remove them instead. Um, and yeah, so what we want to aim for then is maybe get one or two turn early kill onto Seraph. Probably not going to be able to do more than that and uh, try to get spells which are not going to be affected by volatile spells mutator. So let's jump into it. So what then becomes good? Urchin Spines becomes good. Both Titan's Tooth and Frenzy Swarm are really good. Fledgling Imp is really good. It's actually a decent setup to start with. The Frenzied Swarm getting held over is going to be really strong for Tethys. Let's see what Relic we get. And before we jump into that, let's check the uh, Daedalus. So we have this is Damage Shield Daedalus, you can see by the little shield icon around him. So this little shield icon indicates that it's going to be uh, protected. Uh, that means that the bombs are going to be protected, making it a little bit more difficult to kill them with spells. And then we have uh, Armor. Armor Fell. So Armor Fell means that uh, she'll grant extra armor, 10 armor onto every unit as she goes to those floors. And then we have uh, Seraph the Temperance, so we need to be careful about um, how we're going to scale up our damage. Having Fledgling Imps is going to certainly help out a lot because they will scale up the damage and the Rage rage is a pretty good counter to Sap. Let's see what Relic we get. Um, interesting. I think conserving energy between turns could be really good. We could, for example, if we get this to zero cost, there might be turns when we only play the Frenzied Swarm and nothing else, so that later turns we have more opportunity to do damage. We are gonna wanna get rid of our torches, get rid of our train stewards, but I think uh, I think this is gonna be better for us in the long run. Oh, whoop. Don't forget to upgrade your champion. Uh, we're likely going to go Frostbite, I think. Although spell weakness could be really good. Hmm. I actually am really tempted to go spell weakness here, stack up the spell weakness, and then get uh, heavy spell damage. With with Frenzied Swarm, the sweep becomes really strong. Um, the Frostbite is valuable, but I don't think it's going to scale as well. Let's try. Let's try uh, Handheld Totem. Okay, so as mentioned, uh, I'm going to take every trial, even if they seem difficult. Um, this might be okay, depending on if we get early um, early Frozen Lances. The, the hardest part is going to be uh, killing the boss quite early. Uh, without Frostbite, could be a challenge. Mansion is going to help a little bit. Um, hmm. They're going to kill everything right away. I wonder if we just play up in the top floor to make sure nothing gets through. Although the sweep is really valuable. The sweep is really valuable as a bottom floor. Well, we don't have any spells to take advantage of it yet. So let's do, let's do uh, Torch, Tethys, 
Train Steward and Fledgling Imp, I think. Now let's get another Train Steward now. We'll get a Fledgling Imp later. Now ideally we get a high cost spell that can do AoE, like Titan's Tooth. Because now these guys are only doing one damage, so they're not as much of a risk because we have Sweep. We also have a Frenzied Swarm. Let's put the Train Steward in first. Get you in there, and then we Frenzied Swarm. We do the Sweep. This does mean we don't get a floor one kill, probably, but uh, that's actually okay. We'll do a Titan's Tooth now to start stacking um, Frostbite onto the boss. And I think we do that again. Although we can, we can play you, hit you with a Frozen Lance, and then stun and Frostbite you. And this should be a very easy kill. Yeah, even easier because we can stun again. So, pretty good first fight, 1600, and you'll again remember the 1600 is also added by the uh, coins that I get. Um, and what do we want to do here? I think it's Ice Tornado or Helical Crystallis are both good. Incant is also really good. to get frostbite, but I think I'm gonna go more on like a bursty build here. So let's go ice tornado. We need to reduce the cost for sure. Uh, we can't play March of Shields, we can't play Ritual of Battle. We could play another Endless Imp. We can fit them and they are very good. Better would be if we had Endless on them. I think we can take a third one for now. They are really strong, they are a chump blocker and they add a lot of damage, which we're going to need later on. Okay, so we don't get a pick. Uh, more spell weakness or encant sap. I think it's more spell weakness. So we go all in on spell weakness. We lower the cost of our spells. We get holdover on Frenzy Swarm. That's absolutely necessary here. And then let's go for damage reduction and spell damage on, I think it's the Ice Tornado. I think it's okay to have it be two cost. We're going to be able to play the Titan's Tooth for free every turn because of the holdover and the daze. And uh, even if we don't kill the units on the bottom floor, we'll be able to... Uh, we're not going to take any damage from them. Sorry, is what I was trying to say. As long as we get an early... We did. We got an early daze and they both sweep. So this is like the perfect setup here. Let's put the Train Steward in front... Play a Frozen Lance, and then you've got to be kidding me. Okay, we're redoing that <laughs> because uh, my mouse just decided to roll up at the last second. And I consider that an undo situation. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. We need a lot of card draw, so uh, card draw is going to be really helpful for us. You know what, actually, rather than playing the Frozen Lance, we don't need to play the Frozen Lance. Better would be to have the Ember for later. So we keep the Ember... Kill everything. We can torch this. And then I think just getting more ember right now is better. Let's get a rage unit out. And play this to have it on holdover. And we play another rage imp. We play another frozen lance. And we stun in frostbite. Not quite enough, but you're going to die for sure on the next floor. Because you have, yeah, six... One Frozen Lance should kill you. One Torch should kill you. Two Torches should kill you. And an Imp. We're good. <laughs> but it was a little bit closer, to be fair. Uh, Helico Crystallis. Oh, Crypt Builder. Crypt Builder is really good. It's even better in the uh, current... I think we... Do we want more Imps? I don't think we want more Imps than what we have already. Uh, Crypt Builder is really good with... Um, Frenzied Swarm. Deranged Brute is really strong because we are getting Rage Imps. He's also a pretty good tank. So I think we we put train we get rid of Train Stewards, we get the Deranged Brute, we get uh, the Rage Imps, we get the Sweep, and we're still upgrading spells. Uh, double Stack on a Titan's Tooth seems okay. Alternatively, we can lower the cost of something, but I think... 
I'm okay with this. Or, you know what, actually, I'm going to change my mind. We're going to do two uh, train steward remover removals. Because we really need to get to that uh, daze quickly. And I'm getting a little nervous about whether we can get it to it in time. Uh, copy five times. I'm really considering the double stack titans. Oh, we didn't double stack it. But I'm really considering the titan's tooth. It can't be the astronado. We don't have enough ember yet. We might get enough ember later, though. We don't do frenzied swarm, because then they discard each other. I think it's the titan's tooths. It will mean that we need to take ember early. But uh, once we can start discarding Titan's Tooths like crazy, we're going to have massive AoE damage. And that is a way to scale very quickly all the damage we're doing on the enemies. It does mean that this, the uh, spell weakness is not as strong. Um, we can survive and kill everything, so we should do that. And none of this is going to make a huge difference, so we're just going to pass turn. Um, yeah, so we want uh, Fledgling Imp, probably here, and then Frenzied Swarm does two uh, I Titan's Tooths, which is exactly what we need. Uh, one's tit one Titan's Tooth kills you, and we put out a another Rage Imp to tank the bomb, I think, and then we do this. Now everything's stunned and dying. It's fantastic. Uh, Ice Tornado... Oh. How much spell weakness do you have? Two? Because you guys are all dying to that. I think we go for it. Got a lot of damage, actually. And then we uh, save our Ember for later. Come back down. Nope, he's still up there. Um... If I do this up here, yeah, it's not it's not worth it. I think Frozen Lance, Titan's Tooth, Crypt Builder. What are we coming up with? A Titan's Tooth and a Rage Imp? Because I'm, I'm thinking that he can die. Okay, now we don't do it. We do it down here. Oh, I could have just played the Titan's Tooth up top. Maybe I should have considered that. But he's going to die right here. Um, yeah, just do that. And you're dead. Cool. It is kind of difficult to kill off the Rage Imps, which is a problem. Ener uh, Ancient Energy is fantastic. Um, and I think we have the floor we want. Because I don't think we're going to be incanting like crazy. We want... Draw. We want draw. Because we can be frugal with our early turns with Ember to get Ember for the later turns. Okay, uh, we get another unit. Titan Sentry is actually really good as a frontliner for that floor. We just can't fit all the imps now is the problem. Um, we want Tethys Scales is really good. And what do we get here? Double Spell Weakness for sure. Ancient Synergy uh, with Permafrost, I think, is what we want. Um, Spikes is a little bit scary. A little bit scary. We might put Tethys on a different floor. So we get you in there. We get you in there. We rage you guys up. And then we get uh, Tethys on the middle floor. Um, this kills him. So we go one, two, 
And then we save. So that next turn we have more to play. This is going to do 12 damage. If we go Train Steward, Fledgling Imp, Double Train Steward, Fledgling Imp, the Train Stewards will both, Train Stewards plus the Imp will kill him. We can actually keep the Imp alive by doing this. Very tricky fight. Uh, this is where this comes in handy. <laughs> So now we uh, blast them all with Titan's Tooths. Uh, but we are losing everybody. That's a problem. Um, we do it again. And we put you here. And do it again. You are going to have a lot of spell weakness. Let's Ancient Synergy and blast you again. And a single Ancient Synergy kills you. It doesn't kill you? Wow. Okay, this is going to hit for 60 plus another 15. Um, sixty hundred ten plus fifteen. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna take sixteen damage. All right. Well, we're gonna take sixteen damage. Eleven damage. Okay, not as bad. Okay, extra draw is really good. Being able to play three cards for extra draw. Uh, a zero cost. Uh, Guardian's amulet's really good, but I think it's a zero cost crystalline seeds. Is that right? Maybe not. Maybe it is the Guardian's Amp. No. No, no, no. We, take, we keep it as is. If they're stunned, we don't need to worry about the damage they're going to do. Um, none of these. These are all targeted. So we can't play them. We need to get rid of torches. Okay. Spell upgrades again. Well, our spells are going to be very upgraded. Uh, we want Permafrost on Ancient Synergy. And we want extra magic power probably also on the Ancient Synergy. Minus one. I don't think we need minus one anything. I think we just need to remove train stewards. Really would like some unit upgrades, but uh, we're definitely not getting them. We have a chance on the seventh floor and the eighth floors. Looks like on the 8th floor we get to upgrade our units. So that floor was kind of tough. This one looks like it's also going to be kind of tough. But now we can actually play on the bottom floor as long as we get an early um, AoE. Which Oh wow, we do. Okay. Let's get you in there, get you in there, get you up front there, and then uh, Frenzied Swarm kills everything. Cool. Uh, get you up front and actually want both of you up here and we're going to not stun them we want to kill the imps because we want to make room for uh, the other unit yep deranged brute one we titans tooth Titan's Tooth does 20 plus 10 Frostbite damage. Ice Tornado is going to be better. And hopefully we get it. There's a Rage Imp. We can put him up here for fun. There's Ice Tornado. That kills both of them off. And this kills everything here. Keep our Ember. You're going to have enough. To then just die to this. Okay. And we play Ice Tornado. We 
we hit you, we hit you, we stun you and put three Titan's Tooths on you. And then Ancient Synergy plus all these should kill you. Cool. So that worked out pretty well. Uh, Guardian Stone. I still don't think we need it. I think it's not, doesn't fit. Uh, Imp in a Box is actually pretty good. Depending on which imps we get. I would love to get Rage Serum, but we just can't afford it. I think we do get Imp in a Box. The biggest problem is not being is that we can't kill off the imps consistently, but we can tank with them, which does help. Uh, we're going to duplicate something. What are we going to duplicate? Um, spell Rail Spike we can put onto a torch. Because the torches are pretty bad. And then I think we duplicate Ancient Synergy. But the problem with duplicating Ancient Synergy is the Ember cost. It has Permafrost, but then we lose it. Ah, oh, Permafrost actually was bad. We should have gotten Holdover on it. Uh, but it's fine. It's still the best spell, burst spell we have in the deck. And we just try to avoid playing all of, all of, all of our other spells. We try to get rid of all the torches. We can get rid of one now, which will help out a lot. And then uh, we play Ancient Synergy whenever it comes up. Okay, so we can play Imp in a Box. Okay. We can play you out. Uh, we can play the Molting Imp now. I want you to be able to die. So yeah, we're gonna do this. And you're gonna die, and then uh, we will just discard in Titan's Tooth here to get you stacked with some Frostbite. Mm -hmm. Now we can play you here as well. Put the Imp up front. I think we do have to... I think we just play the torch here. It's gone. Um, I really want to get the Frostbite guy in there. But I think we need the Rage Imp up front for now. There is Ancient Synergy. We can't play it yet. Let's just blast these guys. Cool. Now they're all dying. There will be a turn when we want to... Uh, have them tank, which is I think right now, because we can put both of them in there. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to wait for another round to get you to come back. Let's uh, offering token still keeps them nice and alive, and then we frenzied swarm to blast this one, I think. And there's uh, ancient synergy. Ancient Synergy can potentially do uh, a really insane amount of damage here. Let's let's try it. 192. Not great, but fine. And then we stun. And we can put a Rage Imp in front. Is anything dying? It's not. Let's risk it, and then hopefully we can get him killed the next turn. Are you an AoE? You're not, but the dang Titans... We could we could go for it here. <laughs> Actually got it. That's in, that's incredible. All right, let's. Uh, you know what? With you guys dying already by yourselves, taking seven damage, I feel like just doing this, stacking it on the uh, fells, much better. Um, let's ancient synergy now, and then AOE hit everything. We get it back. Or the second one comes back, I should say. Uh, still just got 192. Um, honestly, Frozen Lance, and then hit you with all this. We're going to kill Fel as she comes down for the final wave.
Cool. That worked out pretty well. I don't know that we're going to be able to get... Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get an early kill onto Seraph. Maybe we will... Uh, transcend him. But again, the issue is we can't... We can't uh, get rid of them yet. But I'll still take it. And... What do we want? More capacity so we can fit an imp. That's actually a thought. We have now... A two extra draw. One from the relic, one from our draw relic. Let's get the capacity. We can fit another imp in there, making it a little bit easier. We get unit upgrades for the first time in our lives. Um, we'll probably get rid of the torches, but let's see what we have for unit upgrades. A large stone on an icy silophyte is pretty good, but actually we don't want large stone because we want rage. Uh, let's put rage on you. And we're going to try to get as many bonuses as we can. Let's also put... And we want multi-strike on her. Let's re-roll. Get multi-strike, please. Endless. Endless on the Transcend Imp. Rage on... As well on you, because you do AoE. And we can incant Armor 1 on the Titan Sentry. That was a really good set of upgrades. Let's remove two Torches. Which does lower the damage of our... Um, Ancient synergies a little bit, but uh, I think it's fine. And spell weakness three. Although we could lower the cost of damage spells, which would make ancient synergy much more playable. But I think it's still just being able to get three spell weakness AOE onto Seraph. Then we can uh, blast Seraph with um, the ancient synergies. Uh, this is going to be tricky, but I think we can still manage it because the frostbite gets through. And we are stunning, hopefully, very early, the units. We have seven card draw. Oh, man, we start with it every time. That's insane. All right, let's uh, get you out. Get you out. Get you out here. And then uh, get you out here. And stun you. And your guys are all dead. Okay. We can fit you in the front. I'm okay with him taking three damage there, and then we just blast this thing. Because you should be pretty easy to kill later on, and we really need to get this imp dead. Okay. Oh, we did draw something. I don't know what it was. Um, let's unbox our imps. Pyre Chomper's great. So we put Pyre Chomper here. We can rage here. Blocking a huge amount of damage. We can Ancient Synergy to kill you. Um, put you out there. And then just discard up here. Take three damage and everything still dies. Seems really good. Uh, let's Rage Imp up here. And then Transcend Imp up here. We want Transcend Imp to die. So let's uh, do the AoE up here. Seems good. This does... No, it doesn't prevent any damage. Let's just do that. Cool. We get Transcend Imp back. Giving us even more rage. And now we're actually okay. With well, let's let him die. We might as well let him die. Uh, let's play this out here. Play Transcend Imp again, this time in the second position. And honestly, we just keep Ancient Synergy. We hit ya, 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 we stun ya. <laughs> awesome. Very, very, very good Floor 7 fight. Urchin Spines. Urchin Spines is really, really good. Harness the Titan could also be really good, but I think it's Urchin Spines. Um, impressive is a way to get rid of an Imp, but I like the idea that we just block with the Imps when we want. Now the question is, can we get an early kill? 
And I'm not 100% certain, to be honest. Um, let's upgrade your health. I think we reroll here. We definitely want multi strike on probably the deranged brute now since we can't get it on the uh, other imp. Uh, let's see what we get for trinkets. Plus seven energy in the first turn of battle is really good. Uh, extra frostbite that doesn't decay is really good. Starting rage is really good. And what do we want in addition? Do we duplicate a third? Two Transcendence is too much. I think we duplicate a third um, Ancient Synergy. Yeah. Now we're going to be able to pretty consistently play. The fact that we spent so much gold might detriment our um, overall score. But I think what I want to do now is play them all on the middle floor. Because they don't have any incants. And we can kill most everything with the spells that we get each turn. So let's stack you guys up here to just directly hit Seraph every turn. Blast you. And there we go. And then we'll wait. Keep our Ember. Let's Imp in a box, see what we get. So we can get extra Ember. Rage. Rage. Urchin Spines. Molting Imp. Transcend Imp. And... I think we save the Ancient Synergy? I don't know. This is like... With two spell weakness, this is... 46 times 3 damage times two. If we wait. We want to make sure that we have a free rain to just hit Seraph. And then we can blast him with this. <laughs> okay. We're pretty likely to get an early kill. Get this down here just to increase. We want to stun everything and hit it with AoE. We're gonna get pretty close to killing him. We lose our Transcend Imp. Play Transcend Imp again here. Again, we still want it to die. Um, we play Ice Tornado. We play this on all of them. Play this again. Now we just want Ancient Synergy on that middle floor, and Seraph is dead. We did not get it yet. But, Ice Tornado. Frenzied Swarm draws us a third card. So close. Seraph is dead the next turn, because he's going to go to the top. And then we can blast him with Ancient Synergy for the kill. That's how you get early kills, and that put us at 46,000. Uh, considering we took some pyre damage and uh, we didn't get a lot of early floor kills, that ends up being pretty good. I think that's... That is for sure top 25. I think it's even top 10, if I'm remembering the scores right. I think the highest scores were 48,000. But let's see how we did. Yep, yeah, top 10. So that's, that's basically how you want to set it up, right? We were always considering how are we going to get an early floor kill on Seraph. The way we were going to get an early floor kill on Seraph was entirely around spell weakness. So we got spell weakness Titan, uh, Tethys Titan's Bane. We got a spell weakness relic that didn't really mean a whole lot. We got two or three spells that did a massive amount of burst damage. And we played exactly so that we'd have a free floor to blast Seraph with a huge spell after stacking all that spell weakness. So the only thing that could have been better is if we'd gotten Multi-Strike on the Icy Silophyte instead of Multi-Strike on the Deranged Brute. Um, we also increased capacity so that we could fit the Transcend Imp. We let the Transcend Imp die multiple times so that we would have plenty of scaling on the damage. Um, and all the rest of this was just fluff. We probably could have gone without Cuddlebeard, and we probably could have gone without Scorching Restraints, which would have increased our uh, total score by another 400 points, which would have put us... 
into second or third place. So taking those two relics put us into seventh or from third place, seventh place. But otherwise, we did really well. Let's check out Dear Sweet Comrade, the top score. My guess is he did something very similar. Oh, he didn't. He went Frostbite, actually. So he took uh, Cuddlebeard. He took Titan's te uh, tit Tethys Titan's Bane. He went for an Incant build with Glacial Seal. Still went Lodestone Totem. Still went Titan's Tooth. Double stacked times six. Now, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that Dear Sweet Comrade does scout ahead. He can uh, come into my um, video and comment and harass me about it, but I'm pretty sure he scouts ahead. Otherwise, I don't know that he would have necessarily taken the Titan's Tooth and then double stacked it, or double stacked it and then uh, times fived it. That definitely would have been able to stack quite quickly. But I think we got we got as, as early as a boss kill or even earlier. When was our uh, Seraph kill? I think it was fifth turn. Yeah, so we got a, a faster Seraph kill. We just took more damage along the way. He probably got much better. Yeah, he got much better uh, fights here because of the frostbite. And on the hidden assault, no, it wasn't hidden assault. Uh, where was it? One of them, we took damage. Oh no, we didn't. Did we not take damage? Oh, I went dear sweet comrade. I'm like, I don't think we did that consistently. We uh, we took damage on hidden assault. Or got a two turn on Hidden Assault. We took damage on the Clip Guard. We could have played this one better. And we probably could have gotten earlier kills. Maybe on the second. No, the second one would have been tough. But uh, overall, it went really well. Got us in the top 10. Um, and that's more or less how I play my daily challenges. Again, focused on trying to get those uh, flying boss kills. So... Um, with that, uh, we are done with this guide. Hope you guys enjoyed, hope you learned something. Uh, let me know in the comments uh, what you would like to see further in terms of guides. I am planning to do an exile guide, uh, exile build guide to follow up my standard build guide that I put out last week. Uh, but if you have another idea of things you want to see, areas where you're struggling and uh, want more um, tips and tricks, please let me know in the comments. If you like this video, if you learned something, please give it a like, uh, subscribe to the channel to see more content. And uh, with that, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.